On today's episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, I'll be talking to you about Ericksonian hypnotic language patterns, at least a couple of them, and I'll be telling you how you can employ them in your coaching practice. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Hi, welcome to another episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. I'm Doug O'Brien, coming to you today from a place even further upstate than I normally am. I'm up in a place near Rochester, New York. So the sound quality might be slightly different than you're normally listening to on these podcasts. Forgive that. Hope that it's good enough. I don't have my microphone with me as I'm up here on a little couple day trip up here. And um, But I wanted to talk to you about a thing that I've been working on as talk to deliver. That's, uh, how do I say this? I've been working on notes for delivering a talk tomorrow. Hope I can say it better tomorrow um, for this, this symposium I'm part of. Any rate, um, it is an essential coaching skill that I'd like to talk to you about, and it has to do with Ericksonian hypnotic language patterns. Yeah, um, <laughs> I feel funny talking about mastery of language patterns when I can barely put together a sentence today. Forgive me that, but here we go. Um, Erickson was good at talking. <laughs> he was good at talking. So uh, we're talking about him, and hopefully you can learn something from what I'm going to say. Um, often, when I do coaching with people, I don't do therapy with people. I, I, I'd make a distinction personally. I know the word coaching, we've talked about it in the spot podcast before. The word coaching is used in a variety of different ways. For me personally, Coaching is a different process than, you know, doing NLP or hypnosis therapy. When I'm working with a therapeutic client, you know, they're usually there for a therapeutic reason. They want to get past a, a, a phobia or a trauma or, you know, they want to lose weight or quit smoking. You know, there's lots of things they come for, you know, to have something fixed, if you will, to, to help them, you know, change behavior or get over a fear or something like that. It's a problem they need help with. Coaching is very different. Coaching is a long-term discussion, really. We, we talk every week for months, and, it, and it's great. It's deep. It's wonderful. But it's conversational. It's conversational. And in these discussions, in these conversations, we, we sometimes go very deep. And sometimes there are times when I'll want to be able to persuade uh, the person of, of, a, of a change of belief that I think would be useful for them. I, I perhaps discern or notice that they have a belief that's stopping them from getting to where they want to go in their lives. And so I, I make an effort through my conversation with them to persuade them of a different way of thinking. Now, I do that, of course, with some of the sleight of mouth techniques that I, I've been teaching over the years and wrote a book about, et cetera. But I also do with what we just call Ericksonian language patterns. Um, Milton Erickson was famous. Milton Erickson, the great hypnotherapist and psychotherapist, um, was famous for doing hypnosis and telling indirect suggestions, giving indirect suggestions. So I know many of you listening to this podcast know exactly what I'm talking about. You're probably better at it than I am. Some of you may not. So for those of you who may not know uh, what I'm talking about, I'm going to tell you. And those of you who do know, you can maybe hear a different slant on it, maybe hear a little bit more, maybe hear it slightly differently than you have done it before. Um, one of the ways Erickson would deliver suggestions is he would shift his tonality and offer what he was saying in the form of a command that was sort of hidden within the sentence structure of a larger sentence. So for instance, a command, if I'm telling somebody to do something, even a hypnotic command, I'll say something like go into trance, right? It's a direct command, go do this, go into trance. I, if I was a 
uh, admiral or something. So, you know, swab the decks. You know, I tell people to do something. I'm issuing commands, right? Do this. Go do that. Talk to my dog. Sit down. Roll over. Play dead. You know, it's like you, you give commands. And commands have a particular tonality, don't they? We're not asking. I'm not saying, please sit down. Please, could you please sit down? I'm saying, sit down, Rover, sit down, right? It's a command. There's a tonality involved here. So when you shift your tonality to a commanding tonality, it comes across as a command. Now, if you sneak it in to a larger sentence structure, the unconscious mind might still, in fact, and we think they do, respond as if it is a command, even though the conscious mind might not notice. So as an example, uh, if I was to say to you, um, sit down and go into trance, that would be a direct command, right? What if I said, however, you know, sometimes people can sit down and go into a trance whenever they walk into this office, right? I've said the same phrase, sit down and go into trance with virtually the same tonality, but I've stuck it in between an opening and a closing of a sentence. It's a little bit like this. It's a little bit like this. An analogy, analogously like this. If I was to say, have my dog Rover, and by the way, I don't have a dog, and if I did, I doubt I'd name him Rover. But just for the sake of argument, if I had this dog Rover and and I needed to give Rover a, um, a pill for his uh, blood pressure or something, and, and Rover didn't like taking pills, then I could do what many a dog owner has done over the years and take a little Rover's pill and put it inside of a little piece of hamburger or something that Rover likes eating and uh, say, hey, Rover, treat, 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 and toss it up in the air and he'd go, you know, just eat it down. He'd accept it. He'd eat the whole thing down. He wouldn't even know it was there, right? So in hypnosis, we're trying to do that too. We're trying to sneak in the pill, right? Give the suggestion within the larger sentence structure. People can sit down and go into trance whenever they want to walk into this room, right? You sneak it into the sentence structure. Now, what's important to note is there must be a shift in the tonality. There has to be a shift in tonality. Otherwise, it's not going to come across as a command. It just might be just a sentence. So think of it this way. If I said to you, you are going to the store, it's a sentence, right? I'm saying you are going to the store. It's, a, it's not a command. I'm just I'm, I'm stating a fact, right? If I said, you are going to the store, and my tonality goes up at the end, then it's not a command at all, is it? What is it? It's a question. I'm asking you if you're going to the store. My sentence structure might not might not be, are you going to the store? My, the sentence structure, words, might be, you are going to the store. But with my tonality, you're going to the store? I'm asking a question. If I said with a straight flat across, you are going to the store, tonality, it's just a statement. But if I say, you are going to the store and have my tonality go down, then it becomes a command. So tonality is critical. If you're going to be persuasive with this sort of, you know, Ericksonian hypnotic language stuff, you must master your tonality. That's all there is to it. It has to be there. It has to be there. So tonality is everything. Often it's been described in neurolinguistic programming uh, circles hypnosis circles, perhaps, that communication can be uh, thought of as 7% of of what you get across in any communication is the words that you use. 38%, a much larger percentage of what you get across is the tonality, is, is, is gauged by the tonality or measured by the tonality or produced by the tonality, how you say it, how you say it. And an even larger amount 55%, they say, and of course, I know those statistics are are inaccurate at best, but they're they're approximate, they're close. There's a lot of thought to be argued for. So a large percent, let's say for argument's sake, 55% is your body language when you communicate to someone. Now, right now, as I'm speaking to you, 
you don't know what my body language is. You, you have no idea, but you can certainly hear their tonality. But if I'm speaking to you in person, if I'm there in person and I'm like really serious and you can tell from the look on my face that I need you to go into trance and you know, I want, you know, if you can, you know, really tell I'm, I'm, I'm serious about this. It's like, okay. If, if, assuming you're a client of mine and came into my office for those purposes, you know, you would say, okay, now's, now's the time, right? If I looked confused and, and, and uh, uncertain, and if I looked like I really didn't know if I was really good at this or not, and I said, I want you to go into trance, and my body language showed all that uncertainty, uh, you might not want to close your eyes and go into trance. You might not really trust me about that, you know? And think about this. Tonality, yeah, very, very important. Words, very important. But the way you say it, if I was saying to my wife right now, um, I'm really excited that you're you're – your mother is coming to spend a few days with us. And um, <laughs> while I was saying those words, I was shaking my head no, and I looked like I had just eaten something that tasted very bad. Um, even though my words might be perfectly fine, if you print it on a Hallmark card, it'd be like, oh, thanks, honey, that's beautiful. But, you know, with that sort of green tint to my skin and the grimace on my face and my shaking my head no while I'm saying I'm really glad your mother is coming and my tonality is like I'm really glad that your mother is coming um, you know the words might not come across in quite the same way might they so the, the communication the what you are communicating comes across through your body language and your tonality the words themselves are important, don't get me wrong, and they lessen an impact to the way you say them. I think that's obvious. I think you know that. And when we're talking about Ericksonian hypnotic language patterns, when you're talking about doing this sort of, you know, subtle, persuasive languaging, tonality is even more important. Or perhaps, I don't know, it's more important, but it, it is very, very equally important. It's, I don't know. It's very important. Let's put it that way. You got to do it. You got to have the shift of tonality in order to make that happen. Now, one of the ways you can do that is through your physiology, interestingly enough. So as an example, if I want to say, sit down to my dog rover, sit down. And I, what I might do, very well do, if I had a dog like that, is I'd, I'd take my finger and I'd point to the ground and I'd say, sit down. And I point to the ground where I want him to sit, sit down, sit down. And now as I'm doing that right now on this tape, on this recording, you might be able to actually pick up how my words are being affected by my physiology. It's coming across in the words. If I just said, sit down, Rover, it might not be the same as if I say, sit down. You really almost hear that emphasis that happens. So you can do that too. We call it analog marking. We, we mark out these suggestions when we're doing them. So you can do that with your body while you're recording something and it comes across. If you're doing a conversation on Zoom, if you're doing a conversation on the phone, if you're doing a conversation that you want to you know, be persuasive in, when you get to the place where you're delivering that embedded command, think of this. Think of the way you would use your hand to emphasize those words. How are you going to emphasize those words so they get across? You need to get it across the footlights. You know, interesting thing. When I uh, was a piano major in college, I had this wonderful piano teacher. I've had several wonderful piano teachers. Um, this particular woman was uh, named Claudette Sorel, and she was a concert pianist. She was a brilliant, brilliant musician. And she once told us, our students, that if you wanted to make a, a crescendo, if you wanted the music to get louder and have the audience perceive it as getting louder, you had to make it louder than you would think you would, that the, the the increase had to be greater than you'd expect in order for the audience to get it. She said, and I don't know if this is completely accurate, that it needed to be an increase of at least 10 decibels 
in order for the audience to perceive that there's a, a real change in volume going on. I don't know if that's true. It's a lot. Of, that's a lot of decibels. Ten decibels is considerable. Um, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a it's a good point that you often need to emphasize things more than you'd expect you would have to, in order for the audience, if you will, in this case your listener, your your subject, to get it. You might need to make it bigger than you'd expect in order for it to, you know, get across the footlights, to get out to the listener, to get out to the person who's perceiving it. You might need to exaggerate more than you'd expect. Now, sometimes when you were doing those crescendos in the piano, you would you would actually start a little quieter in order to be able to get to that place where it's louder and louder without having to get too loud because you started softer. So you got a bigger by comparison, increase. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not sure exactly how you translate that to language, but maybe you could figure out a way to do that. Maybe you could have little times where you're talking kind of quietly, and then, you know, with the emphasis, you get louder. Now, also, we're talking about a shift of tonality. So it's not just, obviously, loudness or softness. It's the way you say those things, the tonality that it comes across in. I'm attempting to give you some examples of that as I speak here. I don't know if you're picking them up or not. I don't know if they're loud enough or, you know, contrasting enough for you to really hear the shifts of tonality. Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, it's nice to know that you can learn rapidly now. Now, the other thing that Erickson is very famous for doing, as you, again, are probably aware, is telling stories. Erickson loved to tell stories. Now, he would embellish his stories, as we've mentioned already, with these embedded commands, right? He'd slip in these suggestions within the stories. But sometimes the stories themselves let's not even say sometimes, most times, the stories themselves were great and had meaning to them. Like my story about my piano teacher. I didn't really need to tell you that story, did I? But the reason I told it is because it illustrated it in a different way. And so it became, hopefully for some of us, clearer than it would have been otherwise. Stories do that. The other thing about stories is that stories stick. You know, they do. They stick. They stick with you. The stories will last a long time. Think about this. If I said to you right now, well, that's just like the tortoise and the hare. You know, if I made an analogy and said, that's just like the tortoise and the hare, most people would know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, slow and steady wins the race, right? That Aesop's fables, that's 2,500 years old. That story it's 2,500 years old, <laughs> probably older. Aesop probably didn't even make up that story. He just wrote it down, right? Aesop was a, you know, a, a storyteller. He collected stories from all sorts of places and told them down, wrote them, you know, told them around the, the world, uh, probably not around the world, but around his geographical location. Um, but what sets him apart from other storytellers who did the same thing is that Aesop wrote them down. So we have them attributed to him. But think about that. That story is 2,500 years old, and yet I just said a phrase, and you all know it. It sticks. It lasts. Stories resonate with us. Erickson understood that. So often, especially as he got older and, and, and you know, smarter, you know, he would go with stories. You know, if somebody had asked him a question about how you do psychotherapy, you'd say, well, that reminds me of a story. And then he'd kind of look at the rug and lean forward on the armrest of his wheelchair, and he'd start telling the story in a particular sing-songy kind of way, and then it would have this kind of special meaning within the structure of the story. And then when it was over, he'd finally look up at you. Do you get it? So, 
in the next few weeks and months to come, I will offer you more of these Ericksonian language patterns and other patterns of persuasion within these, these podcasts. So I hope that you enjoyed this one today. Uh, and thank you for listening. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want any more information about today's show, please visit our website at www.essentialcoachingskills.com. Be sure to tune in again next week for our next episode and discover even more about the systems and the secrets that set the best apart. <laughs>